service this morning. Sorry we're coming to you a little bit late, but when we arrived at church this morning, realized we did not have any internet connection. So we had to imp imp improvise, to say the least, but we're glad that you're here and hope you have an awesome worship experience this morning. want to make sure that you have your worship guide. You're going to need that. Fill out the blanks as we go. Answer those questions. Talk about those questions as a family. Think about them. If you're by yourself, uh, reflect on those. We're talking about a pretty hard subject this morning, so I want you to be able to discuss it and apply it to your life. Uh, but if you're a guest with us this morning, we want to welcome you and thank you for joining in with us. Let us know you're watching by putting a comment on Facebook or on YouTube, and we'll get that. Or you can email me at the church office or call us at the church office. Let us know, and we can let you know of stuff coming up for uh, Flint Hill Baptist Church. We want you to be part of our church. Well, uh, let's go ahead and let's continue in worship. Let me open us up in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity to worship together with you. Lord, we just pray that you will speak through me and that you will speak through the songs and that you will uh, touch each and every heart who's watching this morning. Lord, as we sing these praises, may they be acceptable unto you. As we open up your word and hear what you have to say to us, may our lives be changed because we had an encounter with God's word. Lord, if there's anybody there out there that doesn't know you as their personal Lord and Savior, that you'll even use uh, this morning's passage uh, to draw people to you and that people will come into a love relationship with you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You will set your face on my God. Turn and pray for you to heal our land. Father, let revival start in us. And every heart will know your kingdom come. Lifting up the day. The Lord in power and in unity, we will see the nations turn, touching heaven, changing earth, lifting up the name of the Lord in power and in unity. We will see the nations turn, touching. 
Touching heaven, changing earth. Touching heaven, changing earth. Never looking back, we'll run the race. Giving you our lives, we'll gain the prize. We will take the harvest given to us. Though we sow in tears, we'll reap in joy. Lifting up the name of the Lord, in power and in unity, we will see the nations turn, touching heaven, changing earth. Lifting up the name of the Lord, in power and in unity, we will see the nations turn, touching heaven, changing earth, touching heaven, changing earth, send revival, send revival, send revival to us, send revival, send revival. And revive to us. Lifting up the name of the Lord in power and in unity, we will see the nations turn, touching heaven, changing earth. Lifting up the name of the Lord in power and in unity, we will see the nations turn. Touching heaven, changing earth. Touching heaven, changing earth. Touching heaven, changing earth. Today in our sermon, we're going to be talking about slavery and the value of human life. And in our country, the issue of slavery and racism is deeply intertwined. This whole summer, our country has been wrestling with and shining a spotlight on inherent base biases in our society, systematic racism in our culture, and wrestling with how to respond and how to react uh, as we see and listen to the different issues that are on our television every single night when we turn it on. It causes us to evaluate and reconcile our own place in this larger story and what we can be done in the future to set things right. Now I've resisted the urge to preach on these current events or interrupt what I already had planned uh, to talk about race relations. I feel if we're consistent to cover God's word and the entirety of God's word, that racism will be addressed as we go. And today's passage addresses the issues that we're wrestling with as a country today. So I feel it's very appropriate for us to address the issues of race and racial injustice this morning. One thing I don't want to be is silent. Unfortunately, many white Protestant churches have been all too silent on the issue of racism. I know growing up, rarely did I hear a sermon or a pastor imploring us to take a look at our own inherent biases, uh, to challenge us to do what we could to fight racism as we saw it in our circles, and uh, to have a positive influence on the world around us when it came to right racism. And I believe that that silence is part of a larger picture of silence that the Southern Baptist Convention, the association we're so proudly a part of, uh, has been part of. Racism is deeply rooted in the very institution that we align ourselves with. In 1995, the Southern Baptist Convention passed and celebrated a resolution addressing its racist roots and its response to racism today. And many times when resolutions are made in conventions, a lot of times they don't get passed down, they don't get talked about in the local congregation or the local church. I don't know if that was the case 
here at Flint Hill Baptist Church. But I would like to revisit it here today so that I can say that our church, that I can say that I, that, I, that we can say as a body of believers that we were not silent. And we were working for a world and a church and an association where racism is not part of who we are. Now, what I want to do is I want to paraphrase the resolution in 1995 that was passed. Uh, but I'm going to post it in our comment section on Facebook and on YouTube so you can read the entirety for yourself. Uh, but this is what it stated in paraphrase. First, Scripture is very clear that all people of all nations, of all races, are shown no partiality by God. All are equal and equally loved and cared for by our Creator. It is no secret that the Southern Baptist Convention was founded over the use of slavery. Many of the founders of our denomination were slave owners. They fought for the rights of slave owners and they defended the practice of slavery. Now since the eradication of slavery, Southern Baptist churches have failed in many cases to fight for civil liberties for all and even opposed equal rights for African Americans. This history of supporting racism has placed a divide between us and our African-American brothers and sisters in Christ and the African-American community as a whole. And this is unbiblical. And it goes against the very character and nature of God. Therefore, the Southern Baptists make a public statement to the world denouncing racism in all its forms. They also repent and ask for forgiveness in perpetuating racism and systematic racism in our lifetimes. The convention communicates a goal of becoming more diverse and to be welcoming to our brothers and sisters in Christ and the African American community at large. So that basically was the resolution passed in 1995. Since then, the Southern Baptist Convention has sought to be inclusive in many ways, and in many ways they have been successful. Did you know that the largest part of growth in Southern Baptist life is in uh, minority congregations and especially African American congregations, starting church plants and uh, start churches that are African American. Uh, every local association, including ours, is working at beginning and cultivating relationships with African American pastors and African American churches. And I have seen this firsthand. As I've been here and worked closely with the York Baptist Association, they have worked tireless, tirelessly to form those relationships and be as inclusive as possible and welcoming African American churches into our association. Did you know that in 2012, Southern Baptist Convention elected its first African American president? The president of the South Carolina Baptist Association this year elected its first African American president. We are making huge strides to overcome our past, but we still have much distance to go. Most Southern Baptist churches, unfortunately, are just as white as ours is. We will not overcome racism in our church or overcome the racism in our past until our congregations reflect the communities in which we sit. We have much work to do. May we today at Flint Hill Baptist Church condemn all forms of racism and do everything we can to fight systematic racism in our circles of influence. And so that everything we can do, may we do everything we can do to cultivate personal relationships with people that look different than us. It is my prayer still that we will find an African American congregation that we can share our space with, that we can help start an African American uh, church plant or, or share... Um, or a church start. It is, it's my hope that that is your prayer as well. Because when we do that, that will help us form those type of relationships. And we can work together in the kingdom uh, with people that look different than us. May we as a church not be silent about the evils of all forms of racism in the future. And it is my prayer that someday, very soon, our church, our congregation will reflect the diversity that we find in the community around us.
This is my prayer. I love the Southern Baptist Convention. I have, I have been born, bred, and raised in Southern Baptist churches my entire life. We do incredible things, but we can't ignore our racist beginnings. We've come a long way, and we have a long way to go. May you and I, as a church, help this great, great association that we're a part of move towards that goal. So, as I preach today on slavery, may my words and my heart be heard in the context of these realities. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, uh, it's hard. It's easier just to ignore our past. It's easier just to ignore what has taken place in days gone by. Uh, but uh, we are, it is our, we can't move towards the future until we address our past. We can't uh, move to the right thing until we address what is wrong in our past, repent of it, and move forward. So Lord, we do that today. Lord, we pray that we will be a church that will reach out to all people, that value all people, and that our church one day will uh, reflect the community in which we live, where no matter what your skin color, uh, you feel welcome. No matter what your economic background, you feel welcome. No matter what your, where you come from, you are welcome, and we are able to worship together, and we will re reflect heaven on that day when we stand before you. Lord, help us as a country, as a nation, as a church, as individuals, work through in a Christ-like manner, these difficult subjects and realities we face today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So let's open up the Word of God. Uh, Exodus 21 is where we're at today. And so open up and follow along. Use the worship guide that I gave you. Uh, fill in the blanks. Talk about these things as a family or consider these things and pray about these things as an individual. And take an honest look at your own heart uh, as we address these issues uh, today. So Exodus 21, we're going to... Uh, uh, take a look at a bunch of different verses in verse 21. We'll skip around a, a little bit. All right, I've always told you that I'm going to preach the entire counsel of God's Word. I'm going to preach from Genesis to Revelation. I'm not going to skip parts. I'm not going to uh, miss, I'm not going to skip over difficult parts or 
parts that don't seem to apply or parts that are boring. Uh, I believe that the entire counsel of God's word has something to say to us. And so as I've been working through the book of Exodus, the first half of Exodus is <clears throat> real easy uh, to preach, but then it gets difficult as it enters into the book of covenant because it's a bunch of what seem like archaic laws um, and things that don't apply to us. Uh, but I think if we will look, take an honest look at our passage today and prayerfully look at it, I believe there's something we can learn and there's something that God wants to teach us and tell us and apply to our lives today. So that's what we're doing. And because this passage is about slavery and because what our nation has been facing all summer long, uh, this is a particularly difficult passage to talk about. The section is called what we call the Book of the Covenant. It's a guideline that the judges would use to make rulings uh, to make sure that the, they were a people of justice. Uh, last Two weeks ago, we um, took a look at the Book of the Covenant and talked about altars and how they worship. And this week, it turns its attention to slavery. Uh, so as you read the rules or the laws, they're gonna sudden, you're going to suddenly realize that their culture was much different than ours. Theirs was an agricultural culture. Um, and so some of the, and it's an ancient culture. And so some of the things that you're going to read about and the laws you're going to hear are going to seem awfully strange, especially to our modern day sensibilities. Um, but especially, you know, I think it'd be easier if God just said, don't have slaves. Slavery is wrong. It'd have been a lot easier if he did that. But for some reason, at this point, I can't fully answer, he didn't. He gave this set of laws about slavery to the Israelites. But there's something you're going to realize is that they're different. They're different than other laws that other nations have about slavery. If there's anybody who had been cognizant about the uh, terrible nature of slavery, it was the Israelites. Because they had just spent, uh, what, uh, several generations in slavery to Egypt. And they were cruel uh, oppressors, to say the least. And I believe that God is taking Israel from a culture that is like all the other cultures around it that embrace slavery, and he is slowly moving them to a culture that would reject slavery and more look like the character and nature of God. He doesn't do it all at once. For some reason, it's a gradual shift, um, but maybe we'll, we'll talk about some of those reasons as we move forward. But the theme that you're going to find in these laws is that slaves are not property. Slaves are human beings that have value. So much so that God's going to give them a path to a special relationship that we're going to discuss in just a few minutes. So let's read these verses. Now, the book of the covenant kind of jumps around. And so we're going to skip a few verses. Uh, we'll come back to those verses next week. But this week, uh, I'll be skipping around. Uh, I'm just addressing the verses that deal with slavery. Exodus 21, starting with verses 1 through 11. Now these are the rules that you are to set before them. When you buy a Hebrew slave, he shall serve six years. And in the seventh year, he shall go out free for nothing. If he comes in single, he shall go out single. If he comes in married, then his wife will go out with him. If his master gives him a wife and she bears him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her master and he shall go out alone. But if the slave plainly says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him to God, and he shall bring him to the door or the doorpost. And his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall be made his slave forever. When a man sells his daughter as a slave, she shall not go out as the male slaves do. If she does not please her master, who has designated her for himself, then he shall let her be redeemed. He shall have no right to sell her to a foreign people, since he has broken faith with her. If he designates for his for her, if he designates her for his son, he shall deal with her with it as a daughter. If he takes another wife to him, he shall not dismiss her food, her clothing, or her marital rights. And if he does not do these three things for her, she shall go out for nothing without payment of money. Skipping to verse 20 and 21. 
When a man strikes his slave, male or female, with a rod, and the slave dies under his hand, he shall be avenged. But if the slave survives a day or two, he is not to be avenged, for the slave is his money. And then verse 26 and 27. When a man strikes the eye of his slave, male or female, and destroys it, he shall not let the slave go free because of his eye. If he knocks out the tooth of his slave, male or female, he shall let the slave go free because of his tooth. All right, so when we think of slavery, we our minds are immediately taken back to our um, horrible events in our nation's past. But the images in our minds are very different from the context of these verses. Uh, for Hebrew slaves, in certain instances, Hebrews could very voluntarily become slaves. And this was usually motivated by extreme poverty. The process is further explained in Leviticus. If you want to turn to Leviticus 25, verses 39 through 42. If your brother becomes poor beside you and sells himself to you, you shall not make him serve as a slave. He shall be with you as a hired worker and as a sojourner. He shall serve with you until the year of Jubilee. Then he shall go out for you, he and his children with him, and go back to his own clan and return to the possessions of his fathers. For they are my servants, who I brought out of the land of Egypt. They shall not be sold as slaves." So slavery was allowed under the law because it was not intended to oppress or to punish. It was there to help. It was allowed, it was there to help protect and provide for people. So suppose there was a vineyard owner and he had to plant his crop and he plants his crop, not only that he can provide for his family, but he can pay his bills or the things that he needs to pay for. And he doesn't have enough money to cover the crop that year. So he goes and he borrows uh, from his neighbor. Uh, so he plants his full crop. And over the course of the year, a great drought comes. And it wipes out the whole crop. And now he can't take care of his family. He can't pay his neighbor back the debt that he has. Hebrews were allowed to uh, sell themselves into slavery. And they could use that money to help take care of their family and to... Uh, pay the, off their debts. There was no welfare system. There was no social security. There was no ministries around that helped uh, with these type of things when somebody found themselves underwater financially. And so this was uh, a solution to help deal with that, to help provide for those people. Um, so the law gave him the option to sell himself into slavery for six years. He could, he could uh, take care of his financial obligations that way knowing that six years later, at the end of six years, he would face what they called the year of Jubilee. And in the year of Jubilee, they would be set free and they would have a choice. They could go free, go about their business. They are under no obligation to anybody. Or they might look at their life they have as a slave. And they say, well, my family is well taken care of. I have a shelter over my head. I have protection from foreign enemies. Uh, my family is taken care of and they are protected. And I love my slave owner. He treats me like a son. We are part of the family. Clearly that happened many times. And if they got to that point, and those were the realizations, they could make the decision, I'm gonna stay a slave. Not only that, but they would go before the judge. They would, in the public setting, they would draw, they drive an awl through their ear, basically a wooden peg or a primitive, if you will, earring. And everybody knew from that point forward that that slave belonged to that owner from then on out. They made a public statement about it, both the slave and the slave owner. Um, and so that is what many slaves chose to do. Now, I'm not under any impression that slaves were... Um, not Hebrew slaves were not treated poorly. Uh, I'm sure there were many that were oppressed. I'm sure there were many that were mistreated. I'm sure there were many that were abused. Uh, I'm not saying that that abuse did not happen in this, in the, with the Israelite slaves. But what I am saying is that these laws were given and God gave these laws to say, hey, 
You are not to be like other people. You are not to treat other nations, other, your slaves like other nations do. You are to treat them as people who have value, who are uh, who, people who I have created and have ultimate worth, and give them an opportunity to be free. And so that's a huge difference of any other nation that was around them. Uh, so um, could you imagine, and it's probably hard for our sensibilities to say that <clears throat> oh, I would, for a lifetime, be, choose to be a slave. I would uh, choose to be owned by someone. Well, let me tell you a story about Abraham Lincoln. He would often go down to the docks and he would go and redeem or purchase slaves off the auction block so he could then set them free. And so one day he went down there and there was a young girl who was being auctioned off and he started putting in bids for her. And the girl, you know, here's just another white man who's going to use me, abuse me, not treat me uh, correctly. And Lincoln won the bid. And so they were walking away from the auction place and Lincoln turned to the little girl and said, you're free. I've purchased you to set you free. Little girl, what does that mean? He says, you're free to do what you want to do. She says, does that mean I can say what I want to say? He said, yes, you can say what you want to say. She says, does that mean I can go wherever I want to go? And he's like, yes, you can go wherever you want to go. She's like, does that mean I can be whoever I want to be? He said, yes, you can be whatever you want to be. She looked up with tears in her eyes. And she said, then I want to go where you go. And I want to be where you are. That's the picture that even God desired for the Israelites as they dealt with their slaves. Now, a Hebrew slave have every, had every right to remain with the master that he loved. And after that choice was made, the master, as I said, would take that uh, slave before the town, before public witnesses, <clears throat> they do that ceremony, give him that earring, and that slave would be his for the rest of his life. Where the slave voluntarily chose to be a slave of his master. Now I want to shift gears a little bit. Do you know that God calls us to be his slaves? When you were born again, Jesus became our Lord. That means that he is our master. Uh, you don't have the option to choose Jesus as Savior and refuse him as Lord. That's what a lot of people do. They want Jesus to be their Savior, the one who saves them, but they don't want him to be Lord of their life. Um, but that's not how it works. Becoming a Christian is an all or none proposition. A slave is someone who belongs entirely to somebody else. And that's a description of what it means to be a Christian. We belong entirely to Jesus Christ. Think about the moment, that, for a moment, the terminology we use when we are sharing our faith with people. We say, <coughs> we talk about being born again. Uh, we might ask Jesus into our heart. We uh, surrender to Jesus. We turn to Jesus. We trust in Jesus. And all that is true. But we can't leave out the fact that God calls us to be slaves. Salvation is about being a slave to Jesus Christ. We submit everything we are to him our whole life, everything in it. Uh, we don't do what we want to do. We do what he wants to do. We don't seek after the things we want to seek after. We seek what after he wants us to seek after. Maybe a better way to understand it is we're not to be servants um, to God. A servant is a hired hand, and they could quit anytime they want. But a slave is not. A slave is always a slave to God. Uh, it is a decision we make to submit ourselves on our entire lives to God. There's never a point where we say, oh, I'm done. I'm not going to submit to God anymore. I'm not going to serve him anymore. Uh, that it doesn't work that way. And so it's time for us to make sure that we're using the right rhetoric when we talk about how we become a Christian. We must realize our true position in Christ, uh, that we are to fully submit, fully surrender ourselves to our master. Yes, we're Christians. Yes, we're believers. Yes, we're children of God. Yes, we're disciples of Christ. But we must never forget. We must never forget or uh, disregard the fact that we are to be slaves for Christ. 
as we look at these selected texts in Exodus, I want to use that to illuminate our relationship with Christ and what it's to be. So take a look again at verse 5. Here in verse 5, we see the submission of a slave of Christ, the submission of a slave to Christ. Verse 5 says, But if a slave plainly says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free. All right, the slave has been a slave for six years. He has the option to go free. has the option to publicly declare he's going to be a servant of his master forever. All right? It takes action. All right? We, it, it, it takes a life of submission. Um, becoming a Christian is more than a simple belief in Christ. It's not enough to just believe with our minds, that Jesus is the Savior of the world. We have to submit to him. We have to turn everything over to him. Uh, it's not enough to be baptized. It's not enough to, to say a prayer. It's not enough to be a member of a church. To be a Christian is to submit our lives, every bit of our life, to Christ. Consider uh, Jesus as he describes this. In Luke 9, 23, and he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Luke 9, 23, and he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross daily, and follow me. Luke 14, 26, if anyone comes to me, I, I just read that twice, I'm sorry. <laughs> Luke 9, uh, Luke 14, 26, if anyone comes to me, it does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sister. Yes, even his own life. He cannot be my disciple. Then finally, Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. See, Jesus makes it clear that we are to be slaves to him. And that requires submission. My question is, have you done that? All right, the next thing we see in verse 5 is the affection of the slave of Christ. The affection of the slave of Christ. He says in verse 5, I love my master. The Hebrew slave gets to the end of that years and he sees the love that the master has for him. See how he's provided for him. See how he's treated him like a son. See how uh, what he's done for him. And the protection that he's given, the provision that he's given. He says, I love my master. Why would I want to leave my master? Being a slave of Christ isn't a difficult task when you think about all that he does for us. He, provide, he gives us, forgives us of the sins for being Lord of our own lives. He comes and lives inside us through the Holy Spirit. Uh, we're able to have meaning and purpose in our lives. We're able to walk in communion with the Father and experience him and have a personal relationship with him. We get to spend eternity in his presence. It's easy to serve the Lord. It's easy to be a slave of Christ. Uh, he makes it easy for us to love him, to love our master. The love of our master will cause us to remain faithfully devoted to him. The last part of verse 5, we see the devotion of a slave of Christ. The devotion of a slave of Christ. Uh, that part of the verse says, I will not go out free. I will not go out free. The Hebrew slave, even though he has opportunities to go out into the world and to be free, he loves his master so much he decides that he will not do that. He will remain with his master. There are many people today who claim to belong to Jesus, yet there's no evidence of a personal relationship with him. Their lives are direct contradictions to what he's commanded in his word. These are people who had an emotional experience. They might have made a profession of faith, yet they don't possess true salvation. A slave of Christ is one who sees what everything that the world has to offer and says, I will not leave my master. A slave of Christ who is one who lives with an eternal perspective rather than an earthly one and doesn't chase after the things of the world. Verse 6 shows us the identification of Christ a slave of Christ. The identification of the slave of Christ says, Then his master shall bring him to God, and he shall bring him to the door of the doorpost, and the master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall be his slave forever. I don't know about you, that sounds awful to me. I can't imagine 
I'm so glad I'm not a girl so I don't have to get my ears pierced. But this is basically, imagine having your ears pierced with an a hammer and a wooden peg against a door. Yikes, goodness gracious. But what that did was that identified that person, that this is a slave who has chosen and told the whole world that I belong to my master. I have chosen to stay with my master and serve him the rest of my life. And anybody who saw him along the street, oh, that person, he's got an earring in. And uh, that, so he belongs to somebody. Uh, he belongs to his master for the rest of his life. Well, think about what we do when we become Christians. What do we do? We become baptized. We don't do it privately. We do it publicly so the whole world can see that we belong to Jesus Christ, that we're going to serve him for the rest of our life. That's what that means. Uh, we are saying to the world, I am a slave of Jesus Christ, and I'm going to be that way the rest of my life. But it's not just baptism that does that. Our whole lives should tell people that we belong to Jesus Christ, that he is our Lord and our master. Um, when somebody examines our life, it should be visible to them. Oh, there's a follower of Jesus Christ by how they act, the things they do, the things they don't do, how they behave, how they love on people. That is somebody who is a believer in Jesus Christ. They're a slave of Christ. Uh, Paul talks about that in Galatians 6, 17. He says, From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. May that be our prayer, that when people look at us and they see us, they see the marks of Jesus Christ. Uh, even more evident than an earring or an awl through our ear. Uh, Jesus is our master, and we should submit to him, be devoted to him, and identify as slaves to him. Finally, last part of verse 6, we see the obligation of a slave to Christ. The obligation. It says, the last part of verse 6, he shall serve him forever. Shall serve him forever. A slave was obligated to serve his master no matter what. No matter what time of day no matter what the master asked. They couldn't say, well, I'm not going to do that job. Or they couldn't say, <clears throat> I'm going to serve for about six years and then I'm done. Or I will serve for 10 years and then I'm done. No, uh, it was a decision to do whatever the master asked, whenever he asked, for however how long he asked, no matter what the job was. That was the obligation of a slave. The same is true for us. God, we are obligated to serve our master. We can't pick and choose when we're going to serve him, when we're not going to serve him. We can't pick and choose what laws we're going to apply to our life and what laws we're not going to apply to our lives. We can't say, oh, God, I'll worship you and I'll give you this part of life, but I'm not giving you my dating life. My choices are mine when it comes to my dating life or my checkbook's mine. Uh, what, you can have every other aspect of my life, but you can't have this part of my life. No, we don't get to choose what we... Uh, choose to follow or not follow or when we follow or when we don't follow we're called and when we're going to be obedient when we're not going to be obe obedient people want to be delivered from their sins they want to be rescued from hell to inherit eternal life and possess a home in heaven to be able to call on jesus in times of trouble they want the privileges but they refuse to surrender completely to him these are people who profess Jesus, but they want to continue to live their own way of life. They only want to serve Jesus when it's convenient for them. That is not a true slave. That is what we call a spoiled brat. All right. So my question is to you as we close. Are you a slave of Christ? I'm not asking if you prayed a prayer, if you're baptized, or you're a member of a church. Have you submitted fully to Christ, every aspect of your life. If we are his slaves, we should have the mindset of a Hebrew slave. We are to submit to our master. We're to love our master. We're to be devoted to our master. We're to be identified as slaves of our master and we're obligated to serve our master. Does that describe you? If not, let today be the day. Why not today? Surrender to him. Because it's not a burden to be a slave to Christ. 
As a matter of fact, it's a great privilege. And here's the fact. Here's what I want you to know. You are a slave to somebody. You're either going to be a slave to Satan and the world, or you will be a slave to Christ. We'd, we'd like to think we could choose, but we can't. We are a slave to one to the other. We're either a slave to the world, or we're a slave to Christ. Which is it for you? Let me tell you, Satan is a terrible taskmaster. Master. The world is a terrible taskmaster. It only ends in death. But look what happens when you became a slave to Christ. When you say, I'm, I'm going to serve you the rest of my life, Lord. I'm going to live for you. I am yours the rest of my life. I want to be a slave to you. God takes us from being a slave to being sons and daughters of the king. When we are willing to be a slave of Christ, God transforms us and we become co-heirs with Christ where we're able to sit at the right-hand side of Christ beside the throne with all its rights and its privileges. And then we get to operate as sons and daughters of the Lord instead of slaves. But we have to be willing to come to him as slaves first. What a great privilege. What a great honor. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for uh, this passage and how there's so much in there. Uh, just look, on the surface looks like old laws to an uh, ancient culture that had slavery that has nothing to do with our culture today. But we have so much we can learn from it. We learn about the value of human life. And Lord, we learn how we are to respond to you and what it means to be a slave of Christ. Lord, we thank you for these passages. May we apply them to our life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. announcements for you before I go. Uh, this Saturday, we're having I Still Believe out on the front lawn of the church. Uh, movies Under the Stars. It will start at 8 o'clock. We invite you to bring your own lawn chairs, your own blanket for your family. 
bring your own snacks and drinks, come planning to social distance, and stay at least, I'd say, about eight feet away from each other. Uh, we'll be completely safe if everybody stays away from each other. Uh, uh, you can talk to each other, you can wave at each other, you can give virtual hugs, uh, but uh, keep your distance. And what a special night. It'll be our first fellowship we've had since March uh, together as a church family. So it's this Saturday at 8 o'clock, um, and uh, it's I Still Believe. And so uh, be on, plan on joining us on Saturday night if you can. Then on September 6th, we are going to worship in person on the front lawn of the church. We're going to do it at 9.30 to beat the heat, and uh, we'll uh, be doing everything live. Well, I'll be out there on the front lawn. Our praise team will be out on the front lawn. Uh, we will get to worship together. It's at 9.30, September the 6th. Again, you're to bring your own lawn chairs. You're to plan on social distancing. If you're still uncomfortable doing that, you can pull your car up next to the grass or next to that front lawn there. There's parking spaces that face the front lawn. And we're going to have a FM transmitter and transmit the audio over your radio in your car. And you can tune it to there and you can stay in your car, still see us through your car windshield, be in your car, be safe, and participate with us. So you can either sit on the lawn or sit in your car in the parking lot and watch. So that's going to happen September 6th. Believe me, after everything that took place this morning with internet and Wi-Fi, uh, I am so looking forward to being able to do it in person with you and not have to rely on all this technology. So that is September 6th. Put it on your calendar. Plan on it. It's going to be a great morning. Then last but not least, uh, be, please be faithful to give your tithes and your offerings. P.O. Box 518, Pineville, North Carolina, is our address where you can send in your tithes and offerings. You can bring them by the uh, church, eight o'clock, about 8.30 to 4 o'clock. Somebody's at the church Monday through Thursday. And then you can go online at flinthillbc.org and uh, pay online. So thank you for those of you who've been faithful to do that so far. And uh, uh, if you haven't given in a while, uh, we your church could certainly use your support. Just a few uh, things to pray about this morning. Uh, Beth Gold uh, has a urinary tract infection, spent all night in the emergency room overnight. So we just pray for her, to pray for Terry as he takes care of her. We also know that Johnny Butler ended up back in the hospital uh, overnight as well. So pray for both of them. Pray for Jeanette as she takes care of Johnny. If you need anything, reach out. Let us know. Uh, call the church office. Let us know by Facebook. If you're a guest with us today, uh, sorry things are a little bit different and timing was off. Uh, but stick with us. Uh, we'd love to have you part of Flint Hill. I love you guys. If you need anything at all, please reach out, and you have a great week.